Life Church created this podcast because we all need healthy conversations with real people. So this podcast is here to help you start conversations with your life group, friends, and family. Now, on to the show. Welcome to the You've Heard It Said podcast. This is Ali. And this is Jason. And today we're going to play a game, but it's uh, going to require more people. So I've invited Luke, our producer. Hey, Luke. Hey, Ali. Thanks for inviting me. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. And then Audra, one of our storytellers. Hello. So we're going to play a game and it's going to be fast. So I need oh. you to listen to the rules oh, and I'm okay. going to time you. And I'm looking at you, Jason. <laughs> okay. So here on the table, we have four vouchers for free ice cream. The ice cream not for you. It's oh. for somebody else. Now the right. three yes, of you are going to play and decide who gets to have those four ice cream vouchers. Mm. You can decide mm. it any way you want. So just say who you would give the ice cream to. I and have you have kids. 30 seconds starting now. Five kids, three ice creams. That doesn't work. Guys, I have a There's couple of friends here that would really love some ice cream. They've had a hard day today. I think oh. it'd be best for me to... My day's not been too hard. <laughs> Yikes. I would just say, if I got an ice cream, I would give it to my mom because it is uh, her favorite dessert. Ten second warning. And she's yes, number one fan of the You've Heard It Said podcast, like number one fan. So I think she deserves it as a listener and as my mom. I'm good That's with 30 you. seconds, decide. I'm good with you having one for you and your mom okay. as long as I get one. Okay. Yeah, I need one too. So there's three distributed and now there's one more. Your mom gets one and you get one. Oh, I get one? Sure. As long as I get one. Sure. I'll take two. I'm going to give it to my wife. Okay, round two. Everybody put your ice cream back in the middle. You don't get to keep it. (sighs) For round two, there's only two vouchers. So you all have to decide how to distribute those. 30 seconds. Ready? Go. Audra, so I'm... I like your mom, but... (laughs) but. What are you about to say about my mom? She's probably listening to you right now, Jason. Watch it. Maybe your mom should still have ice cream. Okay, I agree. But I don't think it would be fair for you to take both of what's left. Just not That's this okay. ice cream. <laughs> this, what? Okay, well. 10 second warning. I'm taking one for my mom. And I'm taking the other one. Hello? Oh. Jason, you have I'm too sorry. many people to shoot. I'm sorry, Luke, that has been 30 seconds. So, so I don't even get a chance? I'm sorry, Luke, that's how Just it played out. Just because they bullied their way in I'm there? I'm they... so sorry. It's round three in this round. There is one voucher in the middle. And Jason and Audra have to decide who gets it, but Luke, you don't have a say. And so you do we also get to keep talk. the ones we have? You get to keep the ones you have. So only the people with only vouchers the people get to talk. With vouchers get to talk. So decide how you would like to distribute the next ice cream. Thirty seconds. Go. I feel like if you are giving yours to your wife, then you could go on an ice cream date. So maybe you should have the extra one. You're just offering it to me. Yeah. What about your mom? Well, she's already getting one because so I have one. So you don't want to go out and have one with your mom? Well, my ice cream... Luke is gesturing to himself, <laughs> just, just pointing it out. Oh, yeah. We could give it to <laughs> Hey, you only have five seconds. Luke was going to give it to some friend at work who wasn't me. Okay, I feel like, no, I, you, time's up. Decide. I, think, I don't want to have ice cream on my hands. No, <laughs> so decide. I, Luke no, is I'm actually give, my friend, I, so you should decide. I am choosing to give this ice cream voucher to your wife, Christy, so that you can go <laughs> Sorry, on the ice cream date. <laughs> oh, poor Luke. Okay, so round four. Everybody's allowed to talk again. But the Welcome person... Back, Luke. <laughs> the yeah. person, Hi. True colors have been revealed. Colors. Great game. Flavors. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The person who has the most vouchers gets to decide what to do. Oh, there, I didn't see that coming. With all of the vouchers that have been distributed so far. So you can choose to keep them and keep it as is, or you can distribute them to your friend Luke who has no ice cream. It's up to you. So there's four vouchers on the table. Jason gets to decide where they all go. Okay. Okay. Jason, decide. 30 seconds. Well, (laughs) I can tell this is going to be longer than 30 (laughs) seconds. Dramatic. In all of my benevolence. Oh, my You do not have time for a montage. (laughs) Monologue. Monologue. Uh, Okay, there's four total. There's three of us. How is this even a question? (laughs) Okay, Audra, you get two. Five seconds. One for you and your mom because you shared with me. Thank you. Luke, you get to have one, and I get to keep one. Time's up. It felt really weird to all of a sudden be in control of who gets what. 
for yes. me at that yes. moment. Even though it's, we're just having fun and it's just ice cream, I shouldn't have that responsibility or that control over what happens to yeah, Luke and Andre. With the mm-hmm. limited time, limited resources, people started behaving a little differently. <laughs> yeah. A little like out for themselves, maybe. <laughs> How did I you gave f- you ice cream. <laughs> Out of pity at the <laughs> end. <laughs> How did you feel not being able to talk that one round, Luke? That really stunk. Yeah. They very quickly forgot about me over here. Hmm. I actually did forget about you for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Once Luke couldn't talk, I did kind of think, well, it was between me and Jason now. Yeah. Even I mean, it's though. It's like, how could they, hello? <laughs> how, how could they not be thinking about me? What's going on? Well, remember when you were going to give your ice cream to a friend and it wasn't me? That's okay. how. So you made it personal. It's like that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's true. I thought I was doing something nice for Jason, but also I snubbed Luke. So thank you guys for playing. I got the idea from a teacher who tried something similar with 20 students playing for extra credit. And so this episode, we're talking about justice because it's one of the areas that Life Church is passionate about. That can feel kind of loaded for a lot of people, but we can all recognize when things feel in just like this game. I could tell there were times when you were thinking like, that's not fair or Mm -hmm. why is that allowed or things like that. And so the big question is what is biblical justice and what role do we Mm. play in it? And so it's a lot more complex than a game, but we're going to have two conversations with people that I think you'll really like. One of them is with Rusty Pritchard, who's worked with both Tier Fund and Tier Fund USA, which is one of our global mission partners. And then we'll get to hear from Chris Steele, the executive director of the Education and Employment Ministry, to discover how we can play a role in seeking justice in our communities. So when do I get ice cream? (laughs) Well, Rusty, welcome to the You've Heard It Said podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's awesome to be here. Thanks, Laura. Could you tell us a little bit about what the Bible has to say about justice and what role we're supposed to play in it? When I think about what the Bible has to say about justice, I think back to what the role of humans is on planet Earth. Clearly, we think about justice now as like fixing things that have gone wrong, like identifying what's wrong with the world and intervening to set things right. But why should we have the authority to go in and sort things out like that? And I think it really goes back to what the Bible has to say about us bearing the image of God. When you go back to the start of the Bible, the author of Genesis was inspired by God to write down the story of the creation of the whole world. God is pushing back chaos. He's bringing order. He's building something that's amazing in this creation. And what God did in Genesis 1 was something very different. God created human in his image. In the image of God, he created them. So he stamped them with his image. A lot of ink has been spilled about what this means and what makes humans special The author of Genesis knew this too. We didn't even get our own special day in the creation accounts. We share our day with livestock, wild animals, and what the Bible calls the creatures that move along the ground. So what set the people apart, according to the Bible, was the job that we were given. And no doubt, all of the skills and abilities that accompany the ability to do that job. This image bearing is not like some sort of personality thing or some sort of physiological thing. It's a commission. It is that one creature has been set apart to have a special relationship with God and to rule over creation, to reign over creation as God's representative. That's not an indication that we're meant to be tyrants or violent and destructive in our rule. Again, the goal is to be images of the God who so lovingly put that world together. Genesis 2 kind of elaborates on this, says that God put humans in the garden in Eden to work it and take care of it, Abad and Shemar. That word translated work, abad, is also used to describe the work of priests in a temple. That is, working the land, making a living from it, and worshiping God are really intertwined from a language perspective. Humans are told to make a living from creation and to take care of it. And that comes back to our sense of justice and what it means to do justice in the world. It's our job to work and to care for the world that God created. So God's creation project was about creating a world with a man representing him. That's still his plan today, despite all the brokenness that we see. Theologian N.T. Wright says, we're like an angled mirror. We're there to reflect the love and authority of God out into the world. 
and to continue God's creative work in the world, and they were meant also to reflect the beauty and glory of creation back to God. That's what it means to be fully human. That's what we aspire to when we do works of justice, is to create the possibility for people to live out this vocation and to be fully human. But going back to Genesis, there's a wrinkle here. Genesis 3 this thing starts to come apart. Humans, Adam and Eve, decide that they want to obey the voice of a serpent instead of obeying the voice of God, that they're bowing down to something that's created rather than to the creator. They want to know not just good, but they want to know evil as well. You see relationships begin to fall apart. In their relationship with creation, instead of ruling over it, they submitted to it. Their relationship to God was clearly broken. Instead of re representing God, they tried to hide from him. Shame came between these two humans. They began to hide their bodies from each other with clothes. And each of them suffered a kind of internal brokenness in their own being. They had wanted to become equal with God instead of being the image of God. And so they and their descendants and the rest of Genesis become abusive and violent. Their sin was not just eating a fruit or disobeying a simple command. It was giving up their job as rulers and priests. They couldn't undo what God's intent for his creation was, and he immediately starts getting things back on track. In Genesis 12, you see that he calls one family, Abraham and his descendants, to be his representatives again, to worship him and to bless the whole world. We see it all throughout the Old Testament that this is God's plan, that humans should be running his creation and doing what's right. And you skip all the way forward to Revelation 22 in the last chapter of the Bible. It talks about the new creation that God is going to bring about. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in this new city, and his servants will worship him. They'll see his face, and his name will be upon their foreheads. God the Lord will shine his light upon them, and they will reign forever and ever. So how did we get from this brokenness and disaster, the shipwreck that we'd unleashed on creation, and this new creation where people are doing their job? It was Jesus. This is the answer we always know. This is Jesus that intervened here. The answer was that there was finally a perfect human who perfectly did the job, destroyed the forces that trapped us in failure and guilt. Jesus is the true king and the great high priest doing what Adam couldn't do. So what does it mean for us? to go from being failed image bearers to getting our old jobs back, to be useful in God's plan and to bring justice into the world, to put relationships right, we first have to be rescued. Our sins need to be forgiven so that we're free from the bondage to the forces of evil and so that the right relationships can be restored with God, with ourselves, with the creation and with others are things that God sets about putting right through the work of Jesus. So the word for justice and the word for righteousness in the New Testament are very closely related. Often you can just substitute those words for each other. It means to be in right relationship. So to do justice means to look for where relationships are broken and to begin to restore them. So what now? In the light of this rescue, how do we do this job of being kings and priests? As I said before, it's about work. It's being creative. It's taking the good creation and continuing its transformation. When we have jobs, we're involved in managing creation and being good kings. But the other thing that is awesome is it's also our job to make sure that when people want to work, they can. There might be nothing more holy right now than creating jobs, training people for jobs, establishing them as responsible rulers in creation, making a living for themselves. And this is what we have to look forward to. When our great king, when our high priest comes back in the second coming, he is going to actually make things right. What we're doing right now in doing the work of justice is like a, a foretaste of what's going to be coming. So we can work for justice in hope and anticipation that that's the world that we're going to be living in. Welcome to the You've Heard It Said podcast. We're so glad you're here with us. Thank you for having me. We are talking about biblical justice, and you are the executive director of the nonprofit team. And so could you tell us just a little bit about this ministry? Absolutely. And the acronym is T-E-E-M. Right. Uh, yes. Stands for the Education and Employment Ministry. Team was started about 32 years ago and ultimately was founded by a Methodist minister who believed that the church needed to do more 
and go a little deeper in equipping and empowering individuals to break through cycles of poverty. He had a focus on tangible job training and employment assistance and wanted to make sure that, that people had access to basic education. The nonprofit has evolved, and I would say maybe about 10 years ago, our board of directors made a very strategic decision to ultimately tweak our mission statement and focus on individuals who are involved in the criminal justice system in Oklahoma. We did that for a couple of reasons. At, at that point in time, as we began to review our own internal data, the thing that sort of jumped off the page for us was that as far back as we could see, in any given year, about 74% of all the men and women who would voluntarily come to our nonprofit for assistance with basic education, or more importantly, employment, were individuals who had a felony conviction. And that felony conviction ultimately acts as a scarlet letter that can knock a person out of the game. It limits uh, a person's ability to obtain employment. It, it limits where a person can live and, and how a person can you know, interact within the community. And so our board of directors said, we refuse to give up on anyone. And if a person has paid their debt and served their time, it's important that we help support them so that they can reach their full potential. And so we've developed uh, four programs that focus on individuals who are involved in the criminal justice system. And we make sure that they have everything that they need to successfully reenter society, obtain employment, and ultimately achieve stability. We believe that our communities are at their best when everyone is given the opportunity to participate to the greater good. We believe in second chances, and we want to be an entity that supports men and women in overcoming a, a troubled past or a previous mistake. Thank you so much for the work you're doing in our community. Could you tell us how you got involved with TEAM? Absolutely. So at that particular moment in time, Oklahoma led the world in the number of women that were incarcerated per capita. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't figure that out to begin with because as a lifelong Oklahoman, you can't convince me that the people who live in our state are somehow worse than the people who live in uh, another state or another part of the, the world. And about 2008, spending for corrections had become Oklahoma's second fastest growing expenditure. Wow. And it was perplexing when I began to do my homework and I discovered that at that moment in time, not only was Oklahoma's crime rate not decreasing, it was actually going up at a point in time when 38 other states had experienced about a 20% decrease Hmm. in their crime rates. And what I discovered is that in Oklahoma, when a person is involved in the criminal justice system and has to be incarcerated, many times when they've paid their debt and served their time and are released, they're released with like $50 and a one-way bus ticket. Wow. And it's really, really hard to start all over and rebuild your life in a pro-social productive manner with the, the scarlet letter of a felony conviction and on top of that, the, the financial penalties that are assessed to a person who may be convicted of a crime. And it's, it's really a situation that makes it very difficult for a person to do what is asked of them. And so that kind of led me to the nonprofit world to get to be a part of trying to help people successfully rebuild their lives. This episode is all about how we can live justly. And so could you tell us what living justly means to you? Living justly for me means to take the words of the prophet Micah when the Lord says that he has shown us what is required of us, and it's simply this, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. As we look at Scripture, it's very uh, obvious and evident to us that as followers of God, we are called to be in relational ministry with everyone. And yet, there are at least five people groups that are identified by name to give special attention to. So starting in the Old Testament, it would include widows and orphans. Still in the Old Testament, aliens or strangers. If I could use today's term, immigrants. And then in Matthew 25, those who are sick and those who are in prison the first four groups are pretty logical to us. I mean, it makes sense. 
But this fifth group, why would we be called to give special attention to an individual who finds themselves in prison? And I'm at a point right now where I believe that rather than God saying, go and do that to help them, it's God's gift to us. I've never seen a more tangible picture of the redemption process. It's a physical picture of what God does for every one of us spiritually. And when you can receive that grace and accept that mercy and own that forgiveness and share it with others, we too become a picture of who Christ is. And Christ gets to live in us when we're able to embody those attributes both for ourselves and for each other. And then the final thing I would say is I believe that there's a difference between accountability and punishment. And I think that all of us need accountability. We all need discipline. And we all need people in our lives that can make sure that we are doing what we intend to do. And it's no different for somebody who's involved in the criminal justice system. We have never said that there shouldn't be consequences. But it's appropriate consequences. And I think sometimes we confuse the notion of accountability with punishment. And I think it's entirely possible to hold an individual accountable without stripping them of their dignity or of their humanity or of their self-worth. I think that there are ways to help a person learn and grow and move forward in a positive direction without preventing them from having even the opportunity to succeed. Yeah. Could you talk to us about some injustices or complexities that people may not recognize, especially as it relates to the justice system and the work that TEAM does? Sure. So in 2016, 2017, there was a research project conducted as to what was happening in the Oklahoma County Jail. There were a lot of unjust things that were happening. And the research report indicated that Eight out of 10 people that were being held in the Oklahoma County Jail had not been found guilty of anything. 64% were being held on misdemeanors. In 2016, the most common reason a person was in Oklahoma County Jail was for a traffic ticket. Oh my gosh, yeah. The second most common reason a person was in Oklahoma County Jail was failure to pay their fees and fines. What's interesting is that what we discovered in this report is that if two people, and Laura, if I could just use you as an example for this illustration, but the the report indicated that if Laura and Chris were arrested in Oklahoma County for the same crime, we could even be together, maybe even in the same car, and booked into the Oklahoma County jail. If Laura can afford to pay her bond you could be released within 48 hours right. and have the opportunity to return home, can maintain your job, maintain your employment, and live your life until your case is placed on the docket. But for Chris, if I can't afford to pay bond, I have to stay in the Oklahoma County Jail for that duration of time. It takes about 34 days in Oklahoma County. In that 34 days, the person who cannot afford to pay their bond likely loses his job, likely loses his apartment. If I'm the primary caregiver for my children, I lose custody of my kiddos and pretty much all the stability I have in my life. But then to carry on, when our case is called in front of the judge, Laura gets to walk in with her private attorney dressed appropriately, and I'm walking in in an orange jumpsuit in handcuffs with the word inmate printed on my back. I look the part of Mm -hmm. a criminal at this point in time, and I'm meeting my public defender probably for the first time as I'm walking into the courtroom. The judge normally and naturally would ask Laura's private attorney, tell me what Laura's been doing since this arrest. And your attorney's going to say she's been working, she's showing up every day, she's proven that she has moved beyond and that she's learned from this mistake. She's attending church, she's giving back to the community. She is a positive, productive member of our society. The judge is then going to look at my public defender and say, what has Chris been doing? And my public defender's going to say, sitting in jail, your honor. In that scenario, I am seven times more likely to get a harsher sentence than Laura, and the only difference is the amount of money in my bank account. 
And so what we want to do is reduce that discrepancy, those disparities as best we can. And so we actually have staff now embedded in the Oklahoma County Jail so that when a person is arrested, we can look at their case. And if they're being held on a low-level offense simply because they cannot afford to pay bond, we advocate for their release to the judge and ask if he will allow them to work through our program and we connect them with housing, we find them a job, we help make sure that they have access to treatment and whatever may be necessary to help them demonstrate that they too can be a productive member of our community. That's a huge difference you're making in people's lives. Could you tell me a little bit more about some of the volunteers who work at TEAM? What does it look like to volunteer with the ministry? You bet. So we couldn't exist without volunteers. And I would say while there's no one thing that could be done, there's some keys that can significantly reduce the likelihood that a person may find themselves back involved in the criminal justice system. And a couple of those things that are employment obviously. So if you have an employment, according to a study that was conducted about six years ago, you're about 43% less likely to recidivate just by having a job. And I would just also say that a job is, is about so much more than just having a source of income, which is incredibly important. But work gives us purpose. It gives us built-in accountability, a place in the community. We believe that we're created to work. And so just having a job gives an individual an identity that allows them to ultimately participate productively within society. And so what we want to do is invite volunteers to be a part of our service model just to reinforce healthy decision-making, to build some positive, healthy relationships, to be a source of encouragement and a source of light, and to be a lifeline so that when we hit a hard spot, which we all do, we have somebody that we can call and say, hey, man, I need, I need some help processing through this. I need to, to talk to you for a minute. I don't want to go back and do what I've done all my life, but I need some help to make sure that I know what to do differently now. And so we call those mentors, and, and mentors is a pretty heavy word, but really what it is is it's a friend. It's a person who is a, a source of hope and, and light and love we have a clothing closet. We need constant help sorting and, and distributing clothes. It's not uncommon for a person to be released from jail or from prison with just the clothes on their backs. And so we want to make sure that they have basic clothing to wear and basic clothing to, to go to work in, but also basic clothing to go to an interview in. We have a hygiene closet that constantly needs attention. We have a need for job coaches, pers people who are successful in their job to come and share what makes them successful in their job. To reinforce those habits, we need help with building resumes. We need help with practicing interviewing skills. We have a myriad of options and volunteer opportunities that really truly add value and power and enable our participants to be successful. But I would also say, that it's sometimes the, the little things can make the biggest difference. For example, this past year, there was a period of time when, because of COVID, there was no visitation allowed at any of the facilities. And if you can imagine completely being isolated mm -hmm. and cut off from the rest of the world and literally living for that one week in a month when your family may come to visit you or a, a, a friend or somebody, and if that's taken away, it can be extra lonely and challenging. Yeah. And so what we did during that time is we leaned on our volunteers to engage in an old-fashioned letter-writing snail mail campaign. Yeah. Probably had the most significant impact in the lives of our participants just to know uh, they're not forgotten and, and that there are people out there praying for them and that there are people out there encouraging them and waiting for them to return to society so that we can celebrate, so that we can be a part of their restoration and, and a part of their own redemption story. And so it can be as simple as writing a letter mm -hmm. or as involved as developing those relationships. That's awesome. What if there is a group or a life group that's interested in serving together? Would there be any sort of opportunity for them to partner with your organization in that way? Absolutely. There are numerous opportunities for life groups to partner with one another and maybe host a cookout or, or just have a time to come together and bless and get to know people 
in a group setting and just really create a sense of community. Yeah. I think more than anything else, that's what we're looking for. There may be an opportunity for a life group to lead a book club with some individuals who ha- may have a little bit different perspective and maybe we could learn from each other. And I think that any time that you can do things together and serving others, it, the, the blessing is multiplied. So if this is an area that you're interested in, there's a myriad of ways that you could be involved. I would just suggest that if you're interested in helping individuals who are needing a second chance or are in the process of rebuilding their lives, reach out to your local pastors. They can connect you with an opportunity. Most importantly, you can be praying for those who may be separated from their families and not only the moms and dads who are separated from their children, but also the children. Could you tell us one or two of your favorite stories from working at TEAM? Let me start with a gentleman by the name of Justin. He's from uh, rural Oklahoma and just the nicest, neatest, most talented person uh, you could ever meet. And he came to our organization while he was still incarcerated. We saw nothing but potential in Justin from the day that he walked in our doors. But I can remember debriefing with our staff after week one of Justin being in our program and and some of the staff saying, you know, I I don't think he's going to make it because he's so non-responsive. And they said, it's the strangest thing because when you're uh, looking at him eye to eye, he is nice, he is respectful, he is earnest, he seems very determined. But there have been more than one occasion where we would say, hey, Justin, it's time to go to class, and he would ignore us. Or, hey, Justin, it's time to go to lunch. And he would just look the other way and be completely non-responsive. We said, well, let's give this a, a chance. We didn't know if maybe he had some difficulty with his hearing or we weren't for sure exactly what the, the issues may be. But by the middle of the next week, it, it all clicked and Justin became everything that we knew that he could be. I mean, his story is just nothing short of miraculous and remarkable. But at his exit interview, Justin had said that when he first came to team, he kept hearing people say, Justin, it's time to do this, or Justin, it's time to do that. And he said it had been so long since anyone had called him by anything other than DOC number 23423 that he didn't even know who our staff were talking to. But he said by day four, he realized, Justin, that's my name. That's the name my mom gave me. Yeah, That's who I'm supposed to be. That's who I am. And he said that he felt human again. He felt value. And he said that he never looked back because he was reminded of who God created him to be. And I think it's so important that we not lose sight of dignity and value and human worth. A a person can make a mistake, and we all do, but any of us are more than our worst moments in life, and I think that's very important. Those are awesome stories. Thanks so much for sharing with us. Chris talked about the difference between accountability and punishment. I was like, man, that is really good. And then how he mentions that prisoners are specifically called out in Matthew 25 by Jesus because it's a picture of what Jesus came to do for all of us. We deserved punishment. And then Jesus comes to set us free Mm -hmm. and then joins into like a relationship with us. Mm -hmm. He came to bring us justice and we could never earn it. We could never deserve it. And so justice isn't just some extra thing we should sign up to start doing as Christians. Mm. It's part of who God is, and it's actually what it looks like to follow him. It's Micah 6, 8, right? It says, and what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Like that's, that's not a suggestion. It says a requirement. And then Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says that those who hunger and thirst for justice will be satisfied. That makes me think about it differently. Like, yeah, we need to be part of justice, but if we hunger and thirst for it and we're going to be satisfied, that means someone else is bringing justice, right? Mm -hmm. Like maybe God is bringing justice. And like Rusty said, 
Justice is exactly what Jesus came to fulfill. And so often we shy away from justice. But then I'm like, man, I shouldn't be minimizing what Jesus came to emphasize. And we all participate in injustice because all of us live in this world and we've got broken stuff all around us and inside of us. But we can also participate in bringing justice, bringing God's restoration and redemption to the earth as it is in heaven. And so whether you're on the receiving end of injustice right now, or whether you're seeking justice for others right now, Jesus brings hope for all of us. And it's not just hope, but it's also a way forward. Mm, I love that. And the Bible Project has a great video about biblical justice that is worth a watch. Oh, yeah. But they say that justice is courageously making other people's problems your problems. Hmm. And you may have not caused those problems, but you can still play a part in correcting them. And when we do, that's justice. And it's not just like, well, we're doing the serving and the saving. No, it's like when we hunger for justice, we discover more of who Jesus is. And he fills us with more of himself, more of his love, and more of his compassion and perspective. So as we finish this up, Let's just remember, we can't explain all of biblical justice in a 30-minute podcast episode because it's woven throughout the entire Bible, throughout God's story. Mm -hmm. But take some time to think about justice today. Do some of your own biblical research on it. And I'm not just talking about looking at a Facebook post. (laughs) (laughs) And then talk about this question with your life group, with your friends, with your family, and hopefully a neighbor. Are there any areas in my life where I'm contributing to injustice? And what's one way that I can be a part of bringing more of God's justice and goodness to my city and to my neighbor? Such a challenging but important question to answer. And we're going to link to a bunch of resources in the conversation guide, but I want to mention a couple of things. If you want to get involved in a local mission partner like Team in your community, visit www.life.church. neighbor Also, you can sign up there to learn more about justice and all of our other key areas of neighboring at that website. There's also a whole Bible plan about justice where you can learn more, and you can find that in the show notes. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode of You've Heard It Said, and we hope that what you learned inspired you to reach out to a friend, your life group, or a neighbor and talk about it. We even have a conversation guide in the show notes to get you started. Also, if you enjoyed today's story, you can be a part of helping us find more. If you have or know of a great story that we should share on the podcast, you can send it to us at www.life.church forward slash my story. Also, you'd be our favorite person if you took some time to leave a rating and review. It really does help more people find the podcast. Have a great week.